2, happening now. Good morning and thank you for joining us. An update now by Governor David Ige about what's happening next with public schools. 19 has had on our community. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been hard on all of us, but it's especially tough for families with school-aged children. Uh, yesterday, I announced my three priorities, pu protecting the public health and well-being, reviving our economy, and strengthening our community. Reopening our schools touches upon all three of these priorities. Um, first, we need our children, teachers, and staff to be healthy and safe at school. Uh, our ability, second, our ability to restart our economy depends in part upon schools opening up safely so that parents can go back to work without worrying about the well-being of their children. And finally, schools provide services and support to children and families beyond the education, which are crucial for keeping our community strong. For all of these reasons, we want our children to return to school, to prepare ourselves for the decisions that lie ahead on reopening our schools, we are announcing a set of guidelines developed by the State Department of Health that school leaders can use to address reopening safely. The guidance and metrics are for all schools, not just public schools. Dr. Sarah Kemble from the Department of Health is here today to provide information on these reopening thresholds and considerations. Now, also joining us today is Dr. Christina Kishimoto, a superintendent of schools, who will talk about what it means uh, for our public schools. Uh, before I turn it over to Dr. Kimball, I want to announce that this week, the federal government approved issuance of a second round of pandemic electronic benefit transfer program um, benefits. Uh, in the first round, 93,500 students uh, received more than $33 million in additional EBT benefits uh, to support them. This means that more funding will be available to help children who qualify for free and reduced price me school meals during the COVID-19 pandemic. Eligible families can receive up to $286 for each child uh, for the combined months of August and September. The Department of Education is working with the State Department of Human Services to identify all eligible children throughout the state. Uh, if your child is in need and is not enrolled in the free and reduced lunch program, I would uh, like to encourage you strongly that they should enroll no later than September 21st, uh, 2020. And I do know that family situations have changed with COVID-19 uh, and would encourage uh, everyone to consider uh, what their needs are and please register for uh, free and reduced price lunches if you are eligible. I'd like to thank the Department of Human Services for working with our federal partners and the Department of Education to truly help Hawaii's families in need. And I'd like to thank the Departments of Health and Education for collaborating closely to develop these guidance for reopening our schools. Uh, it is so important for us as part of the next step uh, in our reopening plans uh, to be able to address um, children attending school. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor. Next up is Dr. Sarah Kemble, Acting State Epidemiologist. Thank you, Governor. Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be here today with the Governor and Superintendent Kishimoto to share our COVID-19 guidance for schools. The planning for this guidance was a collaborative effort with the Department of Education 
And the guidance continues this teamwork with schools as they reopen and develop blended approaches to educating students and ensuring the safety and well-being of students and staff as well as their families. Our goal is to prioritize reopening schools as safely as possible given we know the benefits of in-person learning and we need to provide decision-making tools on how and when schools can transition to different learning models so that education of our youth can continue when circumstances change. The DOH has adapted guidance based on CDC and other state guidances to create the thresholds for transitioning between in-person, blended, and learning from home models. We believe these guidances will provide the tools, strategies, and safe practices necessary for a balance of practical and science-based decision-making by school complexes. We know that when schools begin in-person learning, there will inevitably be positive cases. Even when a school carefully coordinates plans and prepares, cases of COVID-19 will still occur in schools. All schools must be well prepared for this and ready to work with the DOH, their staff, students and families to control the spread of illness. So in addition to providing specific thresholds, the guidelines assist schools in preparing to respond to positive cases by offering specific recommendations and tools to prepare and build capacity to implement effective mitigation measures. The approach includes partnership between the Department of Health and each school for contact tracing, investigating cases, and notifying students, staff, and their families of positive cases. To safely implement in-person learning, a blended approach based on each specific school's readiness is necessary. The guidelines provide a way to gauge and determine the readiness of each school complex. The, the Hawaii Department of Health's guidance for schools is a living document and will undergo refinement as we approach the gradual reopening of in-person learning in October. The guidance will be posted uh, for the public on our website as of noon today at www.health.hawaii.gov and at hawaiicovid19.com and will be updated as we continue to work on anticipating and addressing the needs of Hawaii students, teachers and staff, their families and the community. The measures will also be linked from that website and are based on a 14-day cumulative case rate this is a different measure than will be used for other reopening guidance and this is intentional this is to give our schools a chance to move first forward first during reopening we think it's very important to have schools have the opportunity for safe and successful reopening ahead of other aspects of reopening um, the measures will be updated every friday as of noon on our website Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Our speaker is Dr. Christina Kishimoto, School Superintendent, Department of Education. Good morning. As the nation's schools continue to have their discussions about how to safely reopen schools, the Hawaii Public Schools is in its fifth week of instruction. There are two weeks left uh, to the first quarter, followed by a one week fall break that's coming up. Our students remain at the center of every decision we are making throughout this pandemic. Our highest priority is ensuring the safety of students, teachers, and staff while minimizing disruption to teaching and learning. We continue to work with and partner with the governor's office, the Department of Health, and our county mayors to uphold that commitment. I thank them for their leadership and their guidance. The, top, the Department of Health's new metrics are a welcome tool that will help our schools to plan for a safe and strategic gradual return to blended learning models based on sound data from our health experts. The parameters or thresholds outlined uh, outline levels of community transmission of COVID-19 that would trigger corresponding recommended learning models to assist with decision making. The variation we're seeing in case counts within individual communities means that we cannot adopt a statewide approach for all schools at one time. 
The new metrics provide benchmarks for our schools to use key health data to begin planning for a safe and strategic increase of on-campus access for students beginning in quarter two next month and for the remainder of the academic year. This planning and decision making will be done at the complex area level in partnership with school principals. Complex areas are made up of groups of feeder schools, high schools, and their feeder elementary and middle schools. Most of our schools have been delivering instruction via distance learning since the start of the school year. We extended that mode of instruction from an initial four weeks to the entire first quarter based on conditions at the time. When we talk about a gradual increase of on-campus access, individual school plans could include, for example, prioritizing our youngest learners uh, who may be struggling with virtual learning to come onto campus first, as one example. I know this is a stressful time for everyone and there are differing opinions in the community about how quickly our schools should reopen. This is not a one-size-fits-all approach at this time. Our state as a whole is still navigating how to safely reopen the various segments of our economy and schools are no different. We need to do this well and these metrics help lay the important groundwork for our next level of reopening planning. For planning purposes and to minimize disruption, parents should anticipate that the second quarter will begin as a continuation of learning from home. Following weeks, schools will start to roll out greater reopening uh, blended opportunities. I want to thank our school communities of leaders, teachers, staff, and parents working together to ensure teaching and learning continues during this highly unusual and difficult time. Mahalo. Thank you very much, Dr. Kishimoto. We'll open it up to questions from the uh, media right now. Reporters, please stick to the topic at hand today, uh, COVID-19 guidance for schools. We will open it up to general questions once um, all questions have been asked on uh, the reopening of schools. Uh, and with that, we'll start with Sue Vaughn Lee from Civil Beat, who has the first question. Sue Vaughn. Hi. Um, question is for Superintendent. When exactly are students returning to the Can you hear that? Sivan, can you repeat your question one more time, please? When exactly are students returning to the classroom? We didn't hear a sort of time frame in that presentation just now. Can you elaborate on that? So we've just received the DOH um, uh, guidance. We will be using that uh, to plan for second quarter. Uh, schools will be communicating with their parents around what the second quarter instruction is going to look like. Uh, we will be transitioning slowly back to a blended learning model over the second quarter. Uh, we will not be returning to full in-person instruction until after the winter break, and that will depend on continued guidance and uh, what the metrics show about the positivity rates in Hawaii. Thank you very much, Superintendent. Any other questions from our reporters on this topic? Ashley Mizuo. Go ahead, HPR. Hi, thanks. Um, this is for Dr. Kishimoto and maybe for Dr. Kimball. Um, will these guidelines be available to the public? And can you give some more specific examples of the thresholds that would be um, implemented right now from like what you were saying earlier, it's a little bit general. Can you give some specific examples of what will constitute closing? and? Um, or what would trigger um, schools to be able to bring kids back onto campus? So I thank, thank Dr. Kimball and her team for the guidance that they have provided. I'm going to let her answer more details about when and where this is available, but we did share it with our district leaders uh, this morning to start uh, planning. Uh, the health policy guidance that they are providing will provide us the structure to then make education-based decisions. But Dr. Kimball, I'm going to have you come up and answer the DOH work. Thank you. The guidelines will be posted on at noon today on the health.hawaii.gov website as well as hawaiicovid19.com with a link to the metrics from our DOCD website. So they will be findable there at health.hawaii.gov. 
Um, the more specifics on the thresholds. So at present, we have ranges of um, zero to five cases in the last 14 day period by island as the uh, threshold for in person, um, five to 15 for in person for elementary and blended learning for secondary, 15 to 25 for blended elementary and blended secondary learning, 25 to 35 for blended elementary and, and learn from home for secondary, and 35 and above for learn from home for all. Now, the metrics are one aspect of the framework for reopening and are not a um, hard threshold. They must be taken into consideration with other capacities and resources of schools to implement other key mitigation strategies. So those include, um, are based on the CDC guidance, and they include consistent and correct mask usage, cohorting, or in other words, physical distancing to the largest extent possible, clean hands, hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette, cleaning and disinfection, and contact tracing. So there are checklists included in the guidance that help schools to plan around these considerations, and that in combination with the thresholds can help schools to decide which model of learning is most appropriate at that time. We did think it was important to make this island-specific guidance as each island experiences different patterns of disease transmission, so the metrics will be shared on an island basis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Ashley Mizuo, did you have a follow-up to that? Ashley, I think you need to unmute. Hi, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, can you all, so, uh, sorry, the audio is a little bit hard to hear. Um, so can you clarify, so is it up to individual principals again to decide um, where, like, is it school by school basis or is it more um, by uh, complex? Superintendent is making her way to the podium. So I just want to cl clarify, it's by complex area uh, in order to make sure that schools that are feeders to one another and tend to serve the same families uh, with multiple children are making decisions at the complex area level. And principals are working with their complex area superintendents for their individual designs. Thank you very much. And we have uh, Stephanie Shino. Stephanie is from the Garden Island on Kauai. Stephanie, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, just had a quick question for the parents who are comfortable with their children staying home. Is that still going to be an option um, should they choose to? And also my second question after that, if you could, um, there's a, people want to know if there's a strict protocol when it comes to positive cases in the schools. What is that protocol and how many cases should we see to verify that we need to close down the school? So we will continue the option uh, that is in our return to learn plan that's posted on the DOE, DOE website. Uh, parents can um, opt for uh, learning from home as a, as a model for the semester or for the year. Uh, parents have already signed up for that and are in that mode. So if we return back, as we return back to blended learning, those families who opted for uh, a permanent year long or semester long learn from home will continue in learn from home mode. Uh, the other, uh, uh -huh. um, Stephanie, are you good on that? Um, for the first part, and the second part is, what is the protocols for the schools? How do they know when to close down? How many cases do they have to see? So the, the thresholds that have been provided provide uh, tremendous guidance, additional guidance that we've received from the Department of Health today. Uh, but the Department of Health and the Department of Ed uh, before school uh, started and even during the summer had uh, two protocols for what happens when there is a suspected case or a confirmed case in the school and is a protocol for notifying DOH or for DOH notifying us if they learn about it first. Uh, and it involves closing down the areas where that individual has, uh, has worked for um, some amount of time. Uh, again, uh, closing those areas immediately, cleaning them, 
um, ensuring that they are uh, fogged and clean before they reopen. We also have precautionary steps that we take uh, before we have even absolutely verified information of, of a positive case where we send staff home to work from home until they can get tested or cleared to come back. The Department of Health is a partner with us on the health side of verification and we also send uh, our employees to immediately contact their own physicians uh, and to get in to see their, their, their physicians. Uh, but we do separate them immediately in terms of providing the opportunity to quarantine and work from home immediately until uh, data can be verified. All right, thank you very much. Dr. Kishimoto, we're going to move on to Robbie Dingman right now. Robbie, can you hear us? Robbie Dingman is with Honolulu yes, Magazine. Hi, Robbie. I, hello, can you hear me? Yes, go on. I have two questions. One, would this mean that one school closing in a complex would close all? And my second question is, at the top of the news conference, you folks mentioned that this these guidelines would be for all schools not just public schools i'd like to hear more on that yeah, so a school that uh, needs to close, uh, whether it's precautionary closing or it's uh, a close, closing from verified data, does not necessarily trigger all the feeder schools to close. It is contextualized to what that data is showing us, uh, which is why the information provided by DOH and its guidance not only provides the thresholds, but also provides context for looking at that data. Um, one of the opportunities we had earlier this week was to meet with the Department of Health um, uh, health experts to have a conversation about a particular case and, and is this telling us more information about whether a school or an area has uh, numbers or cases that, that are alerting us um, to, to conditions that would cause a school closure. So it's going to be in continued consultation with Department of Health because the data is contextualized to how much time that employee has been on campus, whether they've been working on campus. We have staff that are, are teleworking right now, so they may not have had in-person contact. And so that would not impact the school, but that count of that employee would be on that school in that complex. So again, the context of the data is extremely important, and this is why um, understanding how the data is used for decision making is so important. Um, and it's not as simple as only looking at thresholds. It's really looking at, at that context. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kishimoto. Moving on to Nicole Tam over at KITV. Nicole? Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, so are teachers and HST on board with these changes, and were they involved in discussions? Because I know previously a lot of the criticism kind of came from them feeling not so involved in the decision-making process. Uh I, I won't answer for HSTA. I will say that um, across the board, um, uh, all of our uh, unions, employee groups, our uh, staff members um, have been asking for uh, these thresholds from DOH. Um, that was that was an area of concern that 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 uh, various groups were articulating. Can we have those thresholds before further decisions are made? And so this is really an important point. In time as we transition from quarter one to quarter two uh, to have these thresholds from the Department of Health that's providing us the uh, strict thresholds and guidance to uh, understand the context and think about decision making. So that's really what they've been asking for. Across the board, you're going to find that you're going to have teachers, parents, staff members, leaders, um, public uh, members of the public who are on both sides of the aisle here. Those that are pushing for returning everyone back into in-person instruction and others who are saying we need more time. And so we know that is uh, the nature of a pandemic. There's never going to be a very easy, straightforward answer around decisions. But what we are committed to is using the health data and making the best decisions possible in partnership with our health officials. All right, thank you, Dr. Kishimoto. Uh, Suvan Lee, you had another question. Suvan Lee, so will be. Thanks a lot. Um, well, the release of these new DOH guidelines changed the way the Department of Education communicates the number of COVID cases within the schools. As we know right now, you're only releasing it by complex area. Is this going to change at all the level of specificity you provide to the public about COVID cases in schools? 
So, Sivan, thank you for that question. I think it's a, it's a question that we need to keep dialoguing around. Um, I continue to have conversations with DOH um, health officials around the data they're going to be providing over time, the data we should be providing, who should be the source of that information. The complexity comes from uh, we and the DOE take action when there is a suspected case, uh, and that's what we're tracking carefully for, for speedy action. We are not waiting for verified cases. DOH uh, works around official verified cases and data. And so there's various ways in which the data can be presented, and we don't want it to be confusing. We also have staff that work across complexes. We have staff that work across schools. Where should that data be counted? How do we provide that data still respecting that this is health data that is owned by an individual and not by the school or the DOE. Uh, so we'll continue to carefully balance this and look at ways in which we can provide more detailed information. If you're following what's happening nationally, this dialogue and this question is at the forefront of every state's conversation. There are a few states last week uh, that moved into new policy uh, uh, policies that they've rolled out around re schools reporting up to a state agency, and they're still trying to figure out as well, is it reported by school? Is it reported by district? Is it reported by zip code in, in other ways. So we're gonna we're gonna continue to look at how the data is reported. Our our balance is between respecting health data that's owned by the individual and also understanding that there is a greater good and need for the community to have good information. All right, thank you, Dr. Kishimoto. I'm Mahia Lani Richardson, Hawaii News Now. Mahia. Mahia, can you let me? There you go. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, this is for Dr. Kimball. Do you think the Department of Health will have enough contact tracers to do the work when these inevitable positive cases arise? Thank you for that question. Contact tracing is really a two-way street, especially when it comes to any kind of congregate setting, and that includes schools. On the DOH side, we receive laboratory reports, we investigate those, and we find out as quickly as we're able to what kind of settings may have been involved in an exposure. Uh, if we identify schools as a potential exposure setting, then we will be reaching out to schools to work with them on the contact tracing efforts. There are many pieces of information that schools have that we do not. The schedules of teachers, students, who was in classrooms at what times, and that type of information we rely on the schools to provide. What we are working and continue to work with the schools on is further uh, um, appendices and guidances to this plan that give more concrete steps for how stu schools can take the first steps in contact tracing while we work on collaboration with DOH. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Jen Boniza, KHO12. Jen? Yes, Jody. This question is for superintendent. Is it accurate to say that until Oahu gets below 35 cases or more per day, that schools cannot reopen? And would learning remain online? Or is it based on community and complex areas? So we are, thank you for that question. Uh, the, the information provided by the Department of Health provides the the thresholds uh, for us to then engage in decision making within the DOE. We are looking by complex area um, and have been in, in conversation uh, with Mayor Caldwell here in uh, Honolulu County around uh, uh, differentiating decisions. So it's not a one size fits all, but it's really uh, an application of the policy by complex area uh, so that we can uh, start moving some of our students uh, towards blended learning as we're ready in different parts of a county as large as, as Honolulu County. Thank you, Dr. Kishimoto. Robbie Dingman, you had a follow-up? Robbie? Yes, on my second question, uh, we don't have the, apologies, we don't have the guidelines in front of us, so how would they be affecting private schools? Because it said the guidelines were for all schools. Thanks for the question, Robbie. Dr. Kimball is making her way to the podium. Thank you. Can she get a little closer to the mic? Is this better? I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Thanks. 
Yes, the guidance is for all schools. It's meant to be general guidance, and hence the thresholds here um, are combined with those mitigation strategies. There may be uh, schools that decide to uh, rely more on the containment strategies and mitigation strategies, uh, and that can be used in combination with the thresholds to make decisions about in-person, blended, or learn-from-home models. So they are meant to be flexible and applicable across a pretty wide variety of school scenarios and settings. Um, and we continue to work with partners both through DOE and HAIS and other um, private school partners to refine some of the um, supporting guidance that may be needed for schools in order to meet all the mitigation strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Temple. We have uh, Wendy Osher. Wendy Osher, go ahead. Can you hear us? Wendy from Mellon Now. Yes, this question is for Dr. Temple. What specifically has changed from the previous guidance released for the fall semester start? Can you highlight some key areas of improvement and indicate to us when this guidance will become available to the public? So again, the guidance will be made public today on our website. Um, you can find it at health.hawaii.gov or hawaiicovid19.com as of noon today. The key difference, uh, one of the key differences is the thresholds for reopening. And I think that's what many people felt was needed, a more concrete framework for schools to think about when to transition between learning models. We've been in discussion about learning models for months, so that's not a new concept, but this provides a more concrete framework to think about transitioning from one level to the next. It also provides additional detail on mitigation strategies to give schools effective checklists and tools to think about how to structure their classrooms, how to maintain effective, clean, environments and encourage the personal behaviors that, that will be needed to keep learning safe. All right, thank you, Dr. Kimball. Susan Asoyan, Star Advertiser. Your hand is up. Go ahead. I was wondering whether Dr. Kimball could say why the Department of Health advised against closing the middle school given the number of cases there and in the Kaliki community. And secondarily, was there evidence of transmission on campus? So two things, I understand you advised against closing, so why? And then the transmission question, thank you. Thank you. The investigation into Dole Middle School's cluster is still ongoing, but we have um, determined that there was likely some transmission on campus, and this is an important point. However, that transmission, once identified, was able to be dealt with through mitigation measures and exclusion of those who were cases or contacts of the case. So through an effective contact tracing process, collaborating with the school, we were able to make decisions that allowed for safe closure of selected parts of campus without closing the entire campus. This is actually um, a scenario that is likely to come up often with schools. As long as we have cases occurring in the community, schools will continue to see positive cases. And we will need to be working together to make those types of decisions about what is an appropriate level of uh, mitigation closure or whether entire school closure is needed. Thank you, Dr. Kimball. Reporters, we'd like to stick to the topic at hand, and then we just have a few more questions, and then we'll move on to general topics. Uh, we will, let's see, we have Stephanie Shino again from the Garden Isle. Stephanie? Uh, thank you. Um, I want to be fair to the parents on Kauai. There, there are parents who do feel that they want to send their children back into school sooner. Is there going to be a date uh, for those for Kauai parents um, before winter break for their kids to try these blendy uh, models? And also going back to the beginning where there was no temperature check. Um, private schools, a couple of my kids go to private schools and they do the temperature checks. Are we still not gonna be doing temperature checks in the public schools? Thank you for your question. Um, Kauai, along with uh, several other areas of the state, 
are looking at their low numbers and already are having conversations uh, about their timeline for uh, moving to uh, blended learning during second quarter. Um, I'm giving those leaders the opportunity to continue uh, and finalize those conversations um, with the principal and the complex area superintendents. All the four, all four county mayors have also been in conversations with our complex area superintendents and I appreciate the availability uh, to be able to roll out these plans. Um, I do not have a, a timeline yet. Again, we were waiting to ensure sure that uh, the DOH uh, 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 measures were released today, that, that we are using their officially uh, filed uh, policy structure um, as our guidance and now our, our schools and complex area superintendents will continue their conversations which they already started in light of what is officially filed on the DOH website um, as threshold. So we appreciate that. All right, thank you very much. Moving on to Tiffany DeMasters, Big Island now. Tiffany? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Great. Uh, this question is for Dr. Kishimoto or uh, Dr. Kimball. I was just wondering, as far as, you know, with what's happening in the schools, do the new guidelines address um, the PPE that's available or um, the cleaning supplies that might be available to teachers? Because I know that was a concern early on. So I'll answer from the DOE perspective first. The um, the the guidance um, uh, has is part of our uh, safety plan that is filed on uh, our website. What we've done is help to answer a lot of the questions we were receiving about the number of uh, types of PPEs that have gone to school, whether they have them. On our uh, safety guidance, um, there is a link that actually shows you the type of PPE and the amount of PPE that has gone to every school. Uh, and so you're able to see the uh, tens and even hundreds of thousands of PPEs of, of different types that are at the school level. Uh, we will continue to focus on uh, on the goal of having three months worth of PPE at hand at each school site and uh, within our departments that are uh, serving students. Thank you, Dr. Kishimoto. Mahalani Richardson, Hawaii News Now. Mahalani. Aloha. This is for Dr. Kishimoto. Can you tell us how many uh, SPED students or other students are already learning on campus? So... I'm going to try to remember offhand, so I think I'm going to have to make sure I give you official data. I believe uh, the last time I answered this question, I was saying it was about 3,000 students on our campuses receiving in-person services um, out of, uh, I believe, 11,000 eligible. Uh, again, I can give you more official data as a follow-up um, uh, because I don't have it right in front of me. I'm trying to keep all this data in my head. Sure. Mahia, we'll um, have do we get back to you on that one just to confirm the numbers that superintendent gave us. Just yeah, I'll just emphasize that the special ed students uh, are not automatically um, learning in person if they can learn via distance learning. So again, it's based on their IEP and it's about 3,000. Thank you very much, Superintendent. Ashley Mizuo, HPR. Thanks. Um, I have two, uh, two questions. Um, one, I think this might... And you can continue listening to the Q&A on our website at khon2.com. Now, I have accessed these guidelines, and I want to walk you through it. It is actually based on the, on the number of cases per 10,000 people per island, not just the number of cases statewide and not just the number of cases per island, but the number of cases per 10,000 population over the past 14 days. Here's what the thresholds look like. Take a look at this green uh, headered chart with me. Zero to five cases per 10,000 people per island um, is uh, the DOE is saying safe enough to go fully to in-person learning for students. And as you can see, the thresholds go up from there to the maximum of, okay, what would, under which circumstances is the health department saying the students would be safest at home and must ha have learning from home in different islands uh, on decisions made by the complex areas. They're saying the Department of Health is telling the DOE and private schools for that matter that 36 cases per 10,000 residents 
over the past 14 days, this is going to be an average, would trigger learning from home for students. Okay, so what does that look like as of today? Well, here is what that would look like. Already, Oahu would be there. On Oahu's chart as of today, the past, uh, the past 14 days of cases averages out to 19.9. Uh, per, uh, cases per 10,000, and that uh, is certainly under the safely under, according to the Department of Health, the stay-at-home threshold, and it appears to fall within the threshold from that first chart that they would call blended learning, and the f phasing into blended learning. Now we go to some other islands, Molokai at 12. They would suggest under that threshold, for example, that it would be in the range. Uh, where the Department of Health says it would be in-person learning for elementary students and blended learning for secondary students. Same for Hawaii Island, uh, but Maui's numbers would actually qualify it for full in-person learning for all students. Same for Lanai and same for Kauai. So go to our website. Uh, there's a link to where you can get the day's um, numbers. And when you dive into the Department of Health website, we're going to put all of this up there, but you can find it either through our website or through the Department of Health. And you can see this for yourself. What this means is this is the kind of chart that's going to be updated um, every Friday according to the Department of Health and the Department of Education and it will be the barometer by which they decide after fall break whether schools would be ready to go back to fully in-person learning and, and we can see if it was today that's they say Maui, Lanai and Kauai would be or if the complex area superintendents on any given part of any island would send the little kids back to first, first the elementary folks in person, um, or if, as in the case of Oahu, they would uh, approach it from a blended uh, situation for both uh, elementary and secondary. What's interesting from looking at this chart, though, is that even if it was today, there would be some degree of on-campus learning allowed under all scenarios from, from every island. So what we just heard was the superintendent of the Department of Health saying that these new thresholds are out there, they're online, we're going to keep analyzing them and walk you through them in all of our coverage today. Um, but the superintendent did make clear that one size does not fit all islands or even all complex areas for that matter. Even though we have a statewide school district, we're divided um, into complex areas that have 15 different uh, leaders in each part of all of the different islands and they will be able to weigh these statistics on their own and to decide after fall break whether they're coming back in person, coming back blended, or if the numbers at that time demand folks to stay at home. But they're not being measured based on just a headcount of positives. It's going to be a number of positives per 10,000 people over the past 14 days. So a lot of math <laughs> being done on the test there. It'll be calculated and posted every Friday. We'll be keeping a close eye on it, and please do stay with us for all the analysis and questions on this. Also announced today, and this is important for parents who have the free and reduced lunch, about 93,000 families were able to take advantage so far of the emergency, um, the pandemic EBT. This was $286 per child for families to get extra nutrition uh, cash for paying for food while they were home and not able to access um, the free and reduced lunches at school if they didn't go to pick them up. There has been an extension of that, but you need to enroll by September uh, 21st in order to take advantage of the second wave. Again, $286 for each child for the combined months of August and September. That's through the Department of Human Services. We'll have links on our website to that too, or if you've already had it, you know where to go ahead and sign up again for that. Governor reminding people that it's very important to do that. Um, also stay tuned later today, we will have coverage of some small business assistance that's going to be coming from the mayor. We hear that that'll be announced this afternoon as the uh, Oahu shutdown continues continues. That's very important because while this Department of Health and DOE uh, press conference was underway, we got the weekly unemployment numbers and once again they are just soaring on Oahu under this shutdown. Another 5,373 people filing for unemployment this week on Oahu. Far higher number of filings percent wise than any of the other islands and that's as uh, small businesses and non-essential businesses continue to be shut down. We'll see uh, Mayor Caldwell's plan for uh, reinvigorating the economy here after some of these shutdowns uh, do, do come to an end.
We'll have all this coverage, of, especially of this Department of Education announcement, on our newscast this afternoon, starting with the K2 and 2 News at 4. I'll see you then, and then continuing on through the evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. This has been a special...